Well, good morning, Rock Creek Church. How are you? Super excited that you're joining us online for yet another worship experience. We are so glad that we have this platform to bring God's word, to bring worship, to bring community to you. Uh, wherever you might be, whatever state you might be living in, and wherever you're viewing this, know that you are not alone. You are part of, A, the greater kingdom of God, but you're also part of Rock Creek Church. We pray for you you on a regular basis. We're constantly thinking of ways to make this platform even better. So we're super excited that you're here and worshiping our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ together as that community. We are continuing to move forward with ministry opportunities, specifically thinking of ways that we can really serve our community. One of those ways is we have our annual foster care Christmas party that is rapidly approaching. That is going to be on December December 12th. There are signups now to get involved in that on our website, www.rockcreekchurch.org. It's right there on the front page. You can click on that, get information, but also sign up to see how you might be able to help us love and to serve those families around Boulder County uh, that are in the foster care system, loving and caring for and cherishing these kids that are otherwise kind of left out. And so we're doing our part as a church. Hopefully, you can join us uh, in that uh, venture. So God bless you as you get ready to worship with Alex and the team and, and listen to the word of God. Lean in. Ask God to open your heart and your mind to the things that he wants to say to you. And know that as you do so, you are loved, you are cherished. We are praying for you and we will see you soon. So God bless you. Enjoy the service. Good morning, Rock Creek Church. How's everybody doing? Doing good. Awesome. Let's stand and sing. If you're online, thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm excited. I always get excited getting to play with a full band. So I hope that this brings some energy that we can come together and raise our voices to our God this morning and praise him for his goodness and his love for us.
sing a song called This I Believe, which uh, there's power in this. I don't know if we really think about this very often, but there is power in declaring what we believe to be true. And so this song, based on the Apostles' Creed, we're going to just straight up sing through what we believe. We believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Trinitarian Godhead. We believe in his love for us, what he's done for us on the cross. We believe in the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives now. And simply by singing this and saying these words, we are giving power to them in our lives. Because if we don't really believe these, if we struggle, if you struggle to believe this stuff, that's okay, right? You don't have to always be living life without doubt completely. Doubt is normal. But if we, if we don't believe it, if we don't live into it, then we're not going to see it applied to our life as much. So I want to encourage you as we lean in, to lean into these truths. As we sing them, don't just sing them as words on the screen, but, but sing these as realities that are at work in your life this morning, right here and now in this room and through your week as you go. So let's sing this together.
that chorus one more time. I believe. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection. Then we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for this morning. We believe in you. We believe in your work on the cross and in the resurrection. And I pray that as we continue on this morning throughout the service, that you would help us to worship you more and more, that we would look to you as our ultimate hope, our salvation, the one in whom our entire life rests. In a, in a state of the world where we feel like we are not in control at all, um, I pray that you would continue to remind us that you are in control, that you hold us in your hands, that you love us, that you cherish us as your children, and that you desire a deeper relationship with us. So draw us closer to you this morning. Draw us closer to each other. And would we as, as a body, as a church, uh, as Rock Creek Church, would we look to you this morning with the intent of knowing you deeper and walking out of here in obedience, taking this knowledge, taking this, this heart and spirit and walking out of these doors with action steps, things to put into place so that we can walk in greater unity and obedience with you. So Jesus, we thank you. We give you this morning and ask for you just to do your thing. Pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Hello. All right. Hey, Rock Creek. Good morning. <laughs> Uh, I am Josh Valdez. I'm one of the elders here at Rock Creek, and you know if I'm doing announcements, everybody else was uh, indisposed, so I'm going to do it today. Um, if you're new, welcome. A lot of new faces here. Excited to see you online. Uh, excited to get you back uh, at church, so can't wait to see you guys in the lobby. It's great to see uh, such a full church and a, a real testament to God's faithfulness to Rock Creek. Um, some family business from time to time. If you're a visitor here, um, you can tune out, but um, we have a few announcements that are um, regarding the, the family. Uh, Mark Popenhagen, our um, children's pastor here, um, is in need of some time and margin right now to take care of some, um, some personal matters uh, and attend to his family. So uh, the, rock, the elder board and the staff here, we're going to allow him to do that. We're going to come alongside him and uh, give him that time. So um, in the meantime, uh, we're going to bring back Naomi Hayes, who um, was an intern for all last year in the children's ministry. She's done everything in uh, the children's ministry from AV to um, a hand in teaching uh, the content to the children. So she's going to step into that uh, space starting today. Um, yeah, it's very exciting. You can go ahead and clap. It's fine. <laughs> Um, so Mark Popenhagen and Naomi will work today uh, for that transition, and then um, Naomi going forward. Uh, we're going to need volunteers, obviously, and always for um, all the ministry that we do here at Rock Creek. It takes people. So if you're interested in that, um, find uh, one of the elders, uh, find somebody on staff, and uh, throw your name in the hat there, and we'll find a, a place for you to, to fit in. Um, Miranda Hansen uh, is our youth pastor. Uh, Miranda is, as you heard before, going to nursing school, and that is starting, uh, we're going to transition her off uh, pastor staff and into that new future at the end of this month. So um, prayers appreciate for Miranda, and a grateful thank you for what she's done uh, for the, uh, the youth ministry, in, especially in the time of COVID and everything that's gone on. So uh, a heartfelt thank you, Miranda. And that's a good, a good segue into this month is Pastor Appreciation Month. So um, being a pastor is tough work. It takes um, a calling for sure, and it takes hard work uh, as you're leading a flock. So um, there, sh there was an email that went out this week. Everyone should have received. If you didn't, um, uh, come find an elder or um, Alex after this, and we can make sure you're on that distribution list. But um, it has some ideas on how we can thank our pastors. Number one, uh, praying constantly for our pastors is 
something that we're going to ask everyone to do and do uh, as consistently as you can. Um, there's also some other ideas to bless them financially and um, write a text, write an email, come up to a pastor and tell them how much um, we appreciate uh, all their sacrifice and what they do for the body of um, the body here at Rock Creek and uh, just uh, uh, the uh, the Capital C Church. So, um, foster care Christmas party. I'm going to read this one because there's a lot of details here, but. Um, the, the foster care Christmas party is coming up in um, December, December 12th, uh, 5 to 8. It's going to look a little bit different this year. Um, obviously, with the restrictions with COVID, we're going to try to make something really fun and exciting uh, that's kind of drive through base for the family and spread out the, uh, the times that uh, the families visit, but still make it really special. So there's a, a tremendous need for volunteers for this event. Uh, we're going to try to decorate the driveway with lights and decorations, uh, have a, a hot cocoa station, uh, caroling, and of course, uh, Santa Claus himself will be here uh, handing out gifts, so it's super exciting. I happen to know Santa, and he's excited as well. Uh, Cindy Dixon is um, taking the point on this, so any questions, please um, contact Cindy Dixon. Stand, Cindy, stand up, take a bow, wave. <laughs> That's Cindy. Um, it's going to take, again, a tremendous amount of volunteers. So please, if, you are, if you've done this in the past, you know how exciting it is. Please volunteer again. If you haven't, uh, get involved. It's really something that uh, will be a really special memory for you um, in, in December. December 12th, 5 to, 5 to 8 p.m. Um, all those details, Alex has explicitly asked me to mention, rockcreekchurch.org. Every detail is on the website. You uh, can hear more about um, all these announcements, men and women's ministries, um, social groups, and um, we're doing online classes. Just a, a ton of information that, the, that Alex, I know, works really hard to keep up to date, so check that out. All right? Okay, got through it. <laughs> um, let's get ready for the message. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you today? Good. It's great, I tell you, to see a six-piece band up here, to see everybody in the audience. Hey, everybody in the back, how are you all doing? And all of you online, we're, welcome to, we're glad to have you and want to welcome you to Rock Creek Church. My name is Dan Montaneri. I'm one of the elders here, and um, I'll be continuing our series on Ephesians. But before we get started, I want to ask you, does anyone like to travel? Okay. Has anybody ever had a chance to see Ephesus? Yeah, a few people. So uh, if you ever get a chance, this is probably one of the most interesting uh, places in all of antiquity. They have some of the ruins, but you can still see a lot of what existed. So bear with me a little bit. This is going to almost be a little bit like a personal slideshow, but not really. So the first next slide, I went, that's where Ephesus is. But here's one of the first things. If you ever get over to Ephesus, this is called the library at Ephesus. It is a beautiful uh, Building, as you can see, a lot of it is still, you know, in ruins, but at the time it must have been incredible to be able to see that. They also have a place called the Grand Theater. The Grand Theater, I think, could hold something like five or 10,000 people. It was huge, and you see that kind of structure at the end. That evidently ascended like three stories high. So they could have people just show up in windows and singing and whatever they needed to fulfill the theater. And interestingly enough, just to show you how smart these people were, when you're standing down in that area in the middle where the, the theater would go on, everybody in the theater could hear you. The acoustics were absolutely amazing, right? And then none of these ruins still exist, but this is the temple to Diana. It existed at the time of Paul, and it was considered one of the, the eight wonders of the world. It was truly an amazing thing to see. And when you sit back and you're going through the Bible and you're walking through the various books and everything, it kind of, I kind of wonder, how do we imagine what those places look like? Well, when you get to see pictures like this, you're going, wow, that was really amazing, right? And if you compare it to other places you've been, you may say, well, Ephesus was one of the best places I've ever been. And I mean, all of the streets were paved with stone. There was running water. To be alive in the, in the city of Ephesus must have been absolutely amazing. 
And so it's like, how do you convey that to somebody who's never seen Ephesus? Well, you begin to use adjectives. You say, it was amazing. Not only was it amazing, it was incredibly amazing. And not only was it incredibly amazing, it was like one of the best places I've ever seen. And as I continue to use superlatives, what you begin to realize is I'm not just explaining or describing something that is common, but something that is absolutely out of the ordinary. And I want you to understand that because that's important when we look at our verse today. If you'd all please rise as we read God's Word. We'll go through the passage I have today, Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. It says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, and that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. You can be seated. Okay, now we're going to show that verse, those several verses again, except this time I want you to pay attention to the highlighted words. When Paul begins to talk about this, oh, not only that, if you pay attention, this is the longest verse in all of the Bible. It's almost as if Paul gets carried away with himself in trying to describe as he comes to grips with everything that God is doing. And Ephesians is considered by some of the theologians to be the highest ground in all the New Testament. As Paul just sits back and he tries to explain to us the full revelation of what uh, Jesus Christ has done for us. And he gets carried away in his thoughts. And he, it's almost as if he rambles, but he keeps using all of these superlatives. He talks not just about uh, God's glory, but the riches of his glory. He talks about not just the spirit, but the power of through his spirit. He talks about not just having love, but being rooted and grounded in love. He talks about the love of God, but he doesn't just go there. He says it's the, the breadth and the length, the height and the depth. And he says it isn't just important that you know, it's a, it, it surpasses knowledge. It's like, what? Surpasses knowledge. Think about that. Everything that you could ever know. And I imagine there's a few people who are engaged in fields that require quite a bit of expertise. For example, Stan is a, is a medical doctor. All the things that he has to know and remember, everything that he knows, this surpasses all of that. Everything that we could imagine. It's like, how do you convey that to somebody? And it just isn't that you know God. He wants you to know the fullness of God. It's like, Okay, that gets tough to get our, our minds wrapped around some of this stuff. Because when we read, sometimes we just read through this and we just go on, right? We take it all as common. But today we're going to camp out a little bit and we're going to examine and we're going to expand on some of these ideas. He also says, I want you to uh, understand how God is and that he is able to do abundantly beyond all that we can ask or imagine. So I want you to, to appreciate the fact that there's a ton of superlatives in, in these verses, and they're there for a reason. Paul is so overwhelmed with what is happening that he begins in, in the very first verse, and he says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Now, the question is, when Paul is saying this, is Paul in a mode of worship? Well, perhaps, but I don't think that's really what he's doing. He isn't in reverence before God, I think what, he, what Paul came to understand is all of this revelation that he was getting about the eternal plan of God from the very beginning, before the earth was made, until Jesus Christ showed up, he sees this plan in its entirety and he falls down on his knees. He's going, this is so amazing, this is so incredible, he can't hardly contain himself. And the question is, why is it that Paul prostrates himself? Well, if you remember when Brian was talking, there were a couple of verses that really kind of stand out from earlier in Ephesians 3. Paul says, he says that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, are heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Well, that may not seem like such a big deal, but we're going to unpack some of this, and hopefully you'll see it's a really big deal what Paul is trying to talk about. In verse 10, he talks about the manifold wisdom of God uh, might be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. And finally, in verse 11, he says, this was in accordance with the eternal plan or purpose which he carried out through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Paul begins to understand all of the things that he had spoken about previously, and he falls down on his face in honor of God because of the great revelation of what God is trying to show him. In verse 15, he says, from whom every family in, on, in heaven and on earth derives its name. Now, family is probably the single greatest institution that God has ever created. Some of us probably have good families, some of us maybe not so much. But in all that God is trying to do, when you understand the eternal creation, there's both heaven and earth, and God is trying to take both of these realms and bring them into his kingdom. And his kingdom isn't political parties, his kingdom is a family. And we're going to talk about that and how special that is. Now, in the ancient world, they had a thing that was called adoption. If anybody ever watched the movie Spartacus, right, you saw some of that. Sometimes a very wealthy person may not have children, and so he would adopt somebody, and he would look for the best and the brightest, somebody who could represent the family and carry on that name. And that's what God is trying to convey. He wants you to be part of of his family. We read that, and perhaps we take it for granted. So I thought I'd tell you a little story about um, a situation that happened with me. I'm very fortunate on both my wife's side and on my side of the family. We have great families. We have great get-togethers. We get along. But sometimes we have to get in our mind, what does it mean to be brought into a family that I don't belong to? Now, have you ever been invited over to somebody's house for dinner? And they tell you, hey, just make yourself at home. Just act like your family. Anybody ever take them up on that? All right, can you, <laughs> did you do that? You go into the fridge, you open it up, you take a swig of milk, maybe let out a belch, go into the big chair and recline and, and say, uh, you know, bring me some Doritos or something. Normally what they're telling you is, hey, I just want you to feel comfortable. And I don't want you to understand that when God says, I want you to be family, he's, he's not just telling you, hey, I want you to feel comfortable. I want you to feel like you're a part. You're a part and a whole lot more, Right? So I remember I, growing up in, in seventh grade, I, I met my best friend, and his family had a farm. And I ended up getting a job. Of course, there weren't a lot of employment opportunities when you're in seventh grade. Um, but working on that farm, um, they grew vegetables. And if you were around in the 1970s and you went shopping at Safeway, you probably were eating vegetables from his farm. And that farm, we would start at 7 o'clock in the morning, and we would work till almost like 8 to 10 o'clock at night. And so I was with them all the time. And after six years, well, it didn't even take six years, I became so common to be around that they all considered me to be part of the family. And they would tell you that. Not only my friend, his mom and dad would tell you that. His, his two sisters would tell you that. Not only that, the brother-in-law, all the cousins, the uncles, the aunts. I knew everybody. I was there all the time, right? And they would tell me, hey, you're just a part of the family because I had become so comfortable in their presence. I was there for dinners. I mean, when we finished on Christmas Day, we would go there after Christmas or after words, and I'd spend several hours watching football and have dinner with them, and we'd carry on. We'd tease each other. We'd do everything together. But you know something? I really wasn't a member of that family. You know how I know that? It's because when his parents died, nobody invited me to the reading of the will. I wasn't an heir. But if you notice when, when Paul is talking and describing your position, he tells you that you are an heir. Now, as a young Christian, when I first read this, I was teaching a class, and there were several older people in that class, and I said, do you guys see this? It says that we're heirs. I said, I don't know exactly what that means, but I know that God owns everything, and he's going to give this to us. Now, I don't want you to think this is some prosperity sermon, right? That you should go to church, that you should, you know... Give your life to the Lord simply so that you can get wealthy in the, in the very end. That's not it at all. As a matter of fact, several of the, of the uh, older people came up to me afterwards and said, isn't a heavenly hope sufficient for you? And it crushed me. It's like, well, sure, I'm grateful just to go to heaven and that ought to be enough, but that isn't what it says. It says that you are an heir. It's like, God's going to do that for me? What does that look like? I have no idea. But I trust when he tells me that, it's going to be far greater than anything that I can ask or imagine. One of the things when we we talk about, well, let's look at verse 16. It says, Paul is continuing on. He says that he, that being God, would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Again, Paul uses one of those superlatives. He talks about the riches of of his glory. Well, when I I talk about the glory of God, what does that make you think of? 
right? Do you see this shining being? I mean, the Scripture says God dwells in unapproachable light, right? When you see the glory of God, it's also the fact that God never lies. There is no sin in Him. There is no corruption. He's perfect love. He's absolute intellect. All of those things basically describe the glory of God. And he talks about the riches of the glory of God. And you have to really understand who God is, how perfect and how holy He is for us to fully grasp everything that Paul is trying to tell us in Ephesians. <clears throat> and a matter of fact, when you come to understand this, it says you'll be strengthened with power through His Spirit. In other words, something's going to happen and there's going to be a transference of this glory that causes something to happen in us. And we'll unpack that further. But one of the things that becomes really important is you have to get a really good understanding of how God sees you. Now, we like to come to church and we hear a lot of times, God is love, God loves me, God loves you, God is love. And everybody can say that and understand that. But what does that mean? It becomes sometimes so common, perhaps we take it for granted. And we should never take it for granted. Because there are other verses in the Bible, for example, in Romans 9.22, do you know it says you're an object of wrath? It's like, wait, what'd you just say? Yeah, you're an object of wrath. It's like, but wait a minute, God loves me. How can I be an object of wrath? What did I ever do to deserve that? Well, again, you have to get God's perspective, not our perspective. So what does God say? In the beginning, he creates the heaven and the, and the earth. He puts us on a perfect situation, and what do we do? We choose to disobey. We choose to do things our way. The Bible then goes on to describe that as sin. And sometimes we have a hard time getting our, our head around sin as well, and we wonder, well, I'm not that bad of a person, or perhaps you really are that bad of a person, and so you feel shame or you feel dishonor or whatever. That's not what I'm trying to convey here today. I just want you to get a proper perspective of how God sees you and how you should see yourself. Because when you understand the truth, it can cause you then to react in the way that God wants you to react. But if you stop and think about sin, did you ever think about that? Sometimes we think about it just in terms of what I do to another person. Have you ever thought about the cumulative effects of sin? I mean, if you say something bad about somebody, eh, maybe that isn't so big of a deal. But if I say something, and another person says something, and another person says something, and another person says something, what do you think it does to that person's spirit? It begins to crush them. What about if somebody hurts another person, and they're hurt again, and again, and again, and again? The cumulative effects of sin are very powerful. Now, when you think about love, or you think about hate, Brian and I were talking about this. I said, what would make you hate somebody? And he said, I think the thing that would make me hate somebody is if somebody hurt somebody that I love. Now remember, God is love. He loves us all, right? So what happens when one of us does something to another one of us that God loves? You ever think about that? Right? Pretty soon he sees this damage, 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 damage. All of the things, and he sees it all over the world. I can't even imagine how God must see the earth sometimes. All of the things going on with 7 billion people, it seems like it would be overwhelming, more than I could take. But yet, God is patient, God is loving. We all have masks on, right? We think about COVID, and we're afraid of it. Why? Because it's possible we could catch it, and it's possible that we could die. And so we go to great extents. We've got a whole government, uh, you know, working and doing various things to make that happen. There's something that's far more deadly than uh, COVID. It's called sin. And you know what happens when you sin? You will die. 100% guaranteed. Right? If we took that as serious as God sees it, right, perhaps we would leave our, our, leave our lives a little bit differently. <clears throat> God is just, and He will not allow the guilty to go free. When you understand that and you understand who you are, you begin to go, ooh, that makes me a little bit uncomfortable and I wish you wouldn't go there. It's like, but we're going to go there a little bit today and I'm going to share with you some of my experience because I want you to understand ultimately the love of God. But for you to do that, you have to understand really who you are as to who God sees who you are. So I'm going to share a little bit of my testimony with you and how I kind of came to an understanding of that. 
One time when I was probably about 20 years old, I was, hitchhike, or I was driving and I picked up a hitchhiker. Now, I don't recommend that you pick up hitchhikers. Um, this particular uh, young man, he was probably about as old as I had. He had a little dog. He didn't fit the profile of a mass murderer or a serial killer, so I thought I was safe. When I picked him up and he got in my car, uh, we began to talk. And little did I know, when I picked this guy up, he was one of those pesky Christians. And he began to ask me, he said, are you born again? And now, I was raised in the Catholic Church, right? So my perspective was completely different. And I just kind of looked at him fish-eyed. It's like, I don't even understand what you're trying to tell me. These words don't resonate. He said, well, do you believe in Jesus? And it's like, who else would I believe in? I didn't understand any of this. And so we began to have this conversation, but neither of us understood what the other one was saying because we had totally different perspectives. In the end, I finally dropped him off at his house, and I kind of felt justified thinking I was the better Christian because I stopped and bought him dinner, right? And I don't say that to lift myself up. It's just that what we do is we self-justify, right? I thought, well, I'm pretty good. I'm not so bad. The truth was I still didn't understand who God, how God saw me simply because I was putting on all of my filters, I understood who God was in a particular way, and I was only going to see him through the way I wanted to see him. I wasn't going to open my eyes and open my heart so that I could see myself as how God sees me. God was going to change that, though. I remember then, probably about a year later, a friend of mine invited me to church. And I thought at the time, that would probably be a pretty good idea because I could probably meet a lot of pretty girls. Um, matter of fact, the first girl I met is sitting right there in front. I uh, ended up marrying her. Um, and that's what I was hoping to do, but at the time, God had a completely different plan for my life. I remember I went to that class, and there, it was filled with all these pretty girls, and the guy was getting up there, and he's teaching Sunday school. And he begins to talk, <clears throat> and um, you have to remember, too, in college, I was in college at the time, and I was a debater on the collegiate debate team, and um, when I would ever be approached by Christians, I normally could dispose of all of their arguments and rhetoric pretty easily right? It's like, come on, is that the best you got? <clears throat> and so I had lots of ways to justify my actions. But I remember in that class, <clears throat> the young man teaching it, he read from 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and here's what it says. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. When he got done saying that, I was stunned. I mean, I wish I could convey how stunned I was. The rest of the day, I couldn't look at any of the pretty girls. I couldn't keep my mind on anything else. Matter of fact, when I got home from church, I walked around my neighborhood absolutely stunned. Why? Because nobody ever told me that. When he read that, I looked at that verse and said, oh my goodness, I have way too many check marks. And it wasn't that God was trying to con condemn me. No, no, it was me. I created the separation from God. God wasn't sitting there saying, I don't love you. He still loved me. The trouble was, I didn't love him. And I had separated myself. And it chose a, a completely different course. And like I told you, I was a debater. And it's like, what could I say? There was no equivocating. There was no arguing. There was no debating. It was just as plain as the nose on my face. Those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And I thought, if what that says is right, that means I'll spend all eternity separated from God. And it truly bothered me. And I think for the first time in my life, I had an actual understanding of how God sees me. Not as some sinner who was beyond redemption, but as somebody who had been separated from God through my own actions. I say this because I want you to hopefully come to that conclusion as well. I want you to come to a, a sane understanding of exactly how God sees you, not to force you into some guilt trip, not to make you feel unworthy, anything like that. Because you'll never understand the love of God that Paul talks about unless you get a sane understanding of who you are before God. In verse 17 to 19, Paul continues, and he says, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. 
Do you notice the superlatives that Paul uses? He uses four dimensions. You thought Einstein was the first one to come up with a four-dimensional universe? It wasn't. It was the Apostle Paul. And when he talks about that, how big do you see the love of God? This big. I don't know how to do depth. I guess that would be time, right? <clears throat> or do you see it even bigger, right? My wife likes to do this with the grandkids. I love you this much, right? Is it from that wall to that wall? Is it from one end of the universe to the other end of the universe? Those things become so grand in our minds, it almost becomes inconceivable to understand that. But I'm going to help us do that today, hopefully. So suppose I did something and I needed your help. And if I said, <clears throat> is there anybody here who, would, who loves me and, and would help me? I think there would hopefully be quite a few hands that would get raised. Suppose I did something and I needed $20. Hopefully somebody here would help me. I would like to think my friend Josh would say, oh yeah, 20 bucks, no problem. I'll help Dan out. Suppose I needed $100. Well, probably not so many takers, right? Somebody would stand up and say, sure, sure. Dan's a good guy. I'll, I'll give him $100. Okay, let's keep raising the stakes. What if it was $10,000? Now almost everybody's hands are down. There's only a couple left up. At least I like to think so. And they would give me $10,000 to get me out of whatever problem I was in. What if what I had done was so horrific that you'd have to trade your, or rather so bad, you'd have to sell everything you have? Would require all the money and require you to sell every possession that you have. Probably the only person in this room willing to do that is my lovely wife. But let's raise the stakes some more. Suppose I had done something so bad that it would require the life of your child. My wife would now be sitting down, as would everybody else in this church. Now, as I'm doing this, let's raise the stakes even higher. Suppose while, while we're going through this series of tests, back here on the screen is displaying a videotape of every terrible, vile thing I've ever done in my life. Everything I've said bad about somebody, everything I've thought bad, everything I've ever done bad, pretty soon most everyone would be disgusted and no one would want to help me at all. And I would begin to probably put my head in my hands and weep bitterly, right? That I was such a wretch that nobody would come to my aid. And yet I would look up and in the back of the church, there's still one person. And he is Jesus Christ, my King. And that's how you begin to understand when Paul says that you know, the height and the length and the breadth and the depth of the love of Jesus. In all of the things, when you get a proper understanding of who you are and you find out who really loves you, the last one standing is Jesus. That's how great a love he has for us. And if you remember from the very beginning of Ephesians, Alex, if you and the, the band want to come back up, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Paul is saying, I hope you can grasp this. I hope that God opens your eyes, opens your heart so you can fully grasp everything that God is trying to do for you. And when you do that, it has a remarkable changing power, just like Paul describes if you remember, the Bible is filled with these stories of people who come to understand exactly who they are, whether it be the woman at the well who had married several people, whether it was the woman caught in adultery, whether it was Zacchaeus, the tax collector, he understood exactly who he was before God, and yet Jesus still loved him. When you think about all the apostles who had forsaken him, even though he called them his friend, when you think about Peter, who cussed out a young girl, who accused him of being one of Jesus' disciples, when you think about Paul, who had Christians murdered for their belief, all of these people had to come to a full understanding of who they were before the Lord. And when they did, and they saw the love of Christ that surpasses understanding, it changed them forever. At that point, they could forgive others, 
even if they had been wrong because they had been wrong themselves or done wrong themselves. They could love the unlovable because we see ourselves as unlovable. And it begins to change the entire world, right? And the list goes on and on. And hopefully many of you could share exactly the same kind of stories about what the love of God has done in your life. And that's why then Paul concludes with his last two verses. He says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. It's my hope here today that you'll stop this next week and ponder exactly who you are before God, that you'll understand who Christ is to you and what he has done and his unsurpassing love to you and that it has a tremendous power to change not only yourself but everyone you come in contact with because that's what Paul describes. Be be able to do abundantly beyond all that we ask or can think. Amen. help if my mic was on. As we respond, let's stand. Uh, We're going to sing two songs. And again, I encourage us to to do this a lot, but I think we need this encouragement. I always need it too, but pay attention to the words that we sing. We're going to sing In Christ Alone, and then a song called Endless that just goes to the length of uh, describing God's love as being truly endless. So don't, again, I want to encourage you, don't just sing the, the words on the screen, but reflect on them, know that these are true, and make this a prayer for us as we leave this morning into this week in obedience and working to follow Jesus more.
on the love of God in a new way this morning. And my prayer for you and for us collectively is that that would sink in more and more. I don't, I don't know if there's a single person on this planet that fully grasps the love of God for them. So I really encourage you, not don't leave this morning thinking, yeah, yeah, I know God loves me. S- sit in it. Reflect on it. Let it sink into your heart and live from that place. So go in peace, Rock Creek Church. We love you. We'll see you next week, and we're praying for you.
Salvation sounds a new beginning As distant hearts begin believing Redemption's bit is un. Carry us, carry us With your endless grace